Uh, my name is Kyle Kastner. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I'm headed to Montreal uh, in a couple days to start graduate school doing neural networks and deep learning. Uh, I did that by way of Paris. I, I spent the summer at uh, Inria Perriotal working with a lot of really great researchers and working on um, scikit-learn stuff and also hacking a little bit on the project I'm about to show. And, uh, so yeah, I spent, I spent the summer working at Enria Periata and uh, working on scikit-learn. And during that process, uh, got into a lot of really interesting uh, computer vision stuff. I actually started a little bit uh, through a Kaggle competition. Uh, it was about uh, cats and dogs and separating those. It was just a binary classification problem. And what ended up winning was a neural network by uh, Pierre Sermonet of NYU, it was called Overfeet, and it really encompassed kind of the state of the art in computer vision, it was really amazing. And this competition is actually kind of the basis of the slides I'm about to talk about, and it kind of forms uh, the modern deep learning computer vision pipeline. So hopefully you guys will enjoy it, and I think we are ready to start. Excellent. Yes. Ta-da! Okay, so that's the introduction. That's the introduction about me. I guess I have to click. Can anyone translate this? Yeah, that one. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this was the original title of my talk, Neural Networks for Computer Vision. I have since changed the name of the talk. This talk is now called The Most Dangerous Game, Sloth Hunting 101. Right now, this makes no sense. Why would you hunt sloths? It's not particularly interesting. But we'll go through a series of stages that will basically allow you to find sloths in natural images and not hunt them. I have to put a special disclaimer. I'm from Texas, but I do not advocate hunting sloths in any way, shape, or form. They're cute, they're cuddly, and we love them. OK, so here's the game plan. Uh, we have some image of, in this case, a sloth, because that's what the talk's about. We want to classify that image. Ideally, we'd like to locate the subject inside of a larger image, do something, hug it, feed it, whatever we want to do. At the end, we'll hopefully make some money. OK. And these graphics don't have labels. I know this, this is counter to what all of your professors ever tell you. But by the end of the talk, we'll put labels on these and explain how the processing works. So this is at least my representation of a classic computer vision pipeline. Basically, you have some image as input. You have fixed feature extractors that have been developed by researchers across the globe. You apply these to extract things, to apply scikit-learn style classifiers afterwards, or R, or whatever implementation you use. And these feature extractors are the subjects of papers and papers and papers and conferences and conferences. Um, recently, there's been a small change in this. And well, before I get to that, I will say that scikit-image and scikit-learn together are very efficient tools for performing these kinds of standard pipelines in Python. And if you're interested in exploring this stuff, it's definitely worth starting here. So recently, there has been a run on deep learning and deep neural networks and deep anything. Uh, it's started to spread to other journals, to other fields. Uh, I think it's contagious. Basically, the idea of deep learning is neural networks. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them. Basically, the construction of a neural network, the training of a neural network, is the subject of college courses in itself. You can think of it as a black box that makes a decision for you, and you learn this decision with a series of rules. It's not so different from the construction of a decision tree or anything else. Uh, you have a series of rules to make this decision, and you kind of wing it, and at the end, you trust that the decision is made. The difference is neural networks don't have the inspection capabilities that decision trees do. So with that said, you can see that the deep computer vision pipeline has neural networks and neural networks all trained together in a big soup. And basically, in the bottom left, we talk about data. So the core fundamental of deep learning is data. If someone ever asks you, do you want more data, you say, 
yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. And you keep doing this and buy more hard drives and buy more computers and it never really stops. It's hoarding, basically. Um, you also need a lot of hardware to do these things. And this will actually, this will actually come in later in the talk. Uh, myself and a, and a collaborator named Michael Eichenberg have kind of tried to bridge the gap between I need a Google cluster and I can run this on my laptop. But in Python, if you want to train neural networks, there are a host of different packages. I'll talk a little bit about Theano and PyLearn2, mainly because these are the things I use. They're from University of Montreal, where I'll be going to work on these things. So I do have a bit of a bias, I have to admit. So uh, the high level concept, a neural network is a universal function approximator. Uh, despite the name neural and the title, really the goal is to take some input and map it to some other output. And they are very, 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 very good at this. Um, if you've been to any of the scikit-learn uh, tutorials or if you've ever done machine learning, you know that overfitting is a problem. And neural networks are the kings of overfitting. So one of the big problems that has historically plagued uh, deep learning is the inability to generalize. You feed it one image of a sloth and you say, great, I can recognize all sloths. And then you give it another sloth image and everything breaks. Uh, there's been a lot of great research on fixing these problems that I won't really get a chance to go into because it's a course into itself. I will stop here to mention that in computer vision, you'll hear the term image descriptors a lot. In machine learning, we call these features, it's basically interchangeable. If you use the one or the other, you can kind of just do a swap in your brain. So with all that said, uh, here's a monster slide. Basically, if you can look at this slide and understand everything in it, feel free to leave because this, this is convolutional neural networks. This is the idea behind Google's image recognition pipeline and Facebook and a whole bunch of others. Uh, and I can't really get into detail about everything but at a high level, you can see we still have our, our friendly sloth as input. Uh, some stuff happens in the middle that we'll just gloss over for now. Uh, you do see the boundaries of feature extraction and classification. Again, this will come in handy. And those weird, crazy pictures at the top are representing a very important concept for deep learning. Uh, deep learning is very specifically focused on hierarchical representations of stuff. And this is, uh, this is a, a, a kind of an academic definition. But what you see is the filters that a trained neural network will ultimately use are pretty simple. They, they kind of look like the classic image filters from computer vision, uh, Gabor filters and things like this, uh, edge detectors, uh, some foreground, background contrast. Like the bottom left, you can see kind of a blue and a kind of a brown. Uh, ultimately, those things are then combined together. They're run over the entire image, which is kind of shown in the top left box. The outputs of those are then combined in a strange way in the second layer, and you start getting responses more like in the middle box. You can kind of see curves, you can kind of see circles, you can, you can see what kind of looks like combinations of the first layer. The third box is then the combinations of the second box, which is combinations of the first box. And this continues onward and onward and onward, and at some point it's very difficult to inspect and it's very difficult to understand what's happening. But ultimately this is the idea behind deep learning and how it is supposed to work. There's some empirical results that show that this is happening, but it's really, really difficult to put strong bounds and strong theory behind it. So. A little bit about the technology. You can see from the previous slide that laying out one of these things might be a little difficult, uh, in code especially. So one technology that was developed is called Theano. It's in Python, but it's not really Python. You basically lay out the concept of the math you want to do. Then Theano takes it and scrunches it up and munges it and makes something interesting. It makes a function out of it. And then you give input to the function and you get output. Now this seems weird and counterintuitive because, because we're used to just, it's Python, define it, run it. I don't want to take this extra compilation step and there's some weird objects that you need to use. But what this does, it allows them to A, optimize out numerical instability and B, it allows them to have multiple backends. 
So one of the really, really nice things about Theano is that pretty much all of the operations have CPU and GPU backends. What this allows you to do is define a computation for, say, a neural network. And you say, OK, I'm running my neural network. It's kind of slow on my CPU. I read an article on Wired that says GPUs are the future of neural networks. And I want to try it. Theano actually has the ability, by setting a command line flag, to run the same computation on the CPU and the GPU. So it's kind, of, it's kind of useful if you're playing around with a neural network and you want to see how fast it is on the GPU. Change a line, test it, see if it's faster. If it's not, keep with the CPU. Uh, it's very helpful, and it, it's worth getting into the straitjacket because you get some real big benefits out of it. Also, they do automatic differentiation. For any of you that have calculated partial derivatives by hand, this is fantastic. It's wonderful. New Neural networks are based on differentiation, and to not have to write it out by hand until you're writing some paper, very nice. So, PyLearn2. PyLearn2 is built on top of Theano. So you can think of it as a series of classes that internally use Theano operations to do things. Basically, they've implemented a whole bunch of neural network tools and a whole bunch of plugins and abilities to do inspection of neural networks. Uh, and this is all great if you want to train a really big neural network in Python and you want to do, do something really complicated that's pretty interesting. Uh, they have a YAML interface, which is a custom file that uses the objects in PyLearn2. So if you are a neural network researcher and you really didn't want to learn Python, which is no one in this room, uh, you could just write YAML instead. It's, it's very, very interesting. I prefer the Python interface. Uh, if anybody's interested in examples of how to do that, I've put it on this on a GitHub repo. I won't talk about it much more. Uh, it's very useful if you're doing neural network research. If your goal is just to use it to identify sloths, there's a slightly different path we can take. So this is the package I discussed earlier. Uh, developed it with a researcher at Enria Perietal named Michael Eichenberg. Uh, he had some interesting problems and thoughts about doing vision tasks. I had interesting thoughts about it. We collaborated, and this is what came out. Uh, it's got a very interface, very easy interface to pre-train networks, specifically the overfeet network I discussed earlier, which beat me in the Kaggle competition and immediately made me want to use it to its fullest effect. Uh, basically, it is a really big, really complicated neural network that was trained at NYU and up until two weeks ago was the state of the art in recognizing natural images. It could take the 1.2 terabyte data set we talked about before with 1.2 million images and get within 12% accuracy somewhere in the top five outputs of that network will be the thing that's labeled in that image, which is very, very impressive and very interesting. And I have a whole bunch of references and links at the back end of this talk. If this is stuff that's interesting, hopefully you can follow the trail of links and start picking up the pieces for yourself, because it's, it's a lot for 30 minutes. Uh, we're also starting to wrap other Theano-based models, mainly because we are curious if we do a really obvious, say, logistic regression, how will that compare to something from scikit-learn, kind of do use another tool in a very dumb way and see if we can figure out some new ways to do classifiers. Uh, we try to be scikit-learn compatible to the fullest extent. Uh, we haven't pushed on all the edges yet, so if there's something broken, raise an issue. Uh, it also includes all the examples I'm about to show from this talk. Uh, run them, see what you think. So also, this image in the right here is a lovely kitten, a lovely puppy. And we ran the overfeet network against it and did localization based on the category dog and the category cat. So there's a classifier that you say, find me a dog, and it returns you the points that correspond to dog and correspond to cat. So very high level image search. So if we remember the pipelines from before, we now have a third pipeline that basically uses the fact that it takes a cluster and GPUs and weeks and lots of expertise to train these things. But a lot of very helpful researchers will give you the filters and the weights from their trained network. So at least for me, I just want to use it. I've been in France all summer. I have a really old, really terrible laptop. 
but I still want to do research. So if I can wrap this model and use it as a black box, you can actually get a lot of mileage out of it. And it basically replaces the researcher, the sift, hog, surf, kind of the, the classical algorithms for extracting features from images. We've learned a feature extractor from data, a lot of data, and we think it's generally useful for natural images. And uh, we want to use that to the fullest extent. Feed it to scikit-learn, see what happens. Also not pictured. Uh, we just use the weights, and it's great. We didn't spend weeks and weeks and weeks training and writing the paper and cross-validating all the parameters, and I like this very much. Outsourcing pain to someone else. So, classification. Uh, basically, the input was the top left image. The algorithm takes this image, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to try to do good classification. You could imagine taking each corner getting labels for those, and averaging, taking randomly sampled chunks, and averaging those. Basically, what we did is the simplest thing possible. If my input is bigger than what I want to accept, I'll crop it and look at whatever's in the center. And that's what you're seeing here. The red box is the cropped view that was fed into the neural network. And what you get out, if you say, give me the top five labels, is ostrich, ox, badger, owl, sloth, from left to right. So this neural network was trained on 1,000 different classes. What this means is that the chance probability is 1 over 1,000. So it gives a probability of 0.19 of this being a slot. So this neural network, at very least with this one input, with this one example, is very, very, very confident that a sloth is in this image, and it will tell you this which is very cool, because I got this image from Flickr. This is not in the data set, this is not anywhere. I'm just downloading images from Flickr and seeing what the answer comes out. And there's an example in scikit-learn Theano. So, next. Uh, localization is kind of an extension of classification. So, in the previous slide we talked about cropping and just examining this one point and getting labels. Now you can imagine, we talked about convolution a little bit in the slide with all the moving stuff and the pretty colors. And it, you can imagine a larger window that is the minimum size of the neural network taking chunks, moving all the way around. And this is what we're showing in the top three slides. In the top left is the input. In the middle is the region that the classifier looks at. The next one is all of the boxes that the neural network looks at, which is the whole image. The bottom left is all of the points that give back a sloth in the top five classes. Kind of scattered. You'll notice there's a gap in the middle. I actually inspected this, and the top five was things like mop, carpet, uh, <laughs> very, very, very textured things. Uh, so if you imagine taking a window where your whole world is only the stomach of a sloth, it would be kind of, you might say, oh, it's fur, but it, you can't, you don't really have any discriminating features. So this is, this is kind of hand wavy and heuristic, but it, it does show that there's something interesting going on in these neural networks. And actually <laughs> inspecting what's happening is an area of active research. So finally, if you're like me and you want to do the simplest thing possible to just draw a box on an image, you take the minimum x, the maximum x, the minimum y, and the maximum y, and you draw a box. And you say, fantastic, I localized this law. That once again, there's a lot of things you could do once you have these points. You could do density estimation, you could do a, a whole host of things to draw better boxes. But this is basically a roadmap of how you could do these tasks in a very simple way using neural networks. So, a third thing I really want to talk about that I think is really, really, really cool is a, a paper from June by Ian Goodfellow and pretty much half of the LISA lab. I have them all cited in a reference. Uh, they did some really interesting work where you actually train two neural networks at the same time. One is, is his only goal is to generate data from pure random input. The other neural network's goal is to look at real data, and then look at generated data and decide whether it's been generated or whether it's real. So you have two neural networks that are basically playing a min-max game against each other. And what you get if you finish this and steal their generator weights, as I did and wrapped and used, is you can feed random input to a neural network and get out things that look like, in the left, 
a generator that's trained on MNIST. In the middle, a generator that's trained on natural images. And on the right, well, right middle, a data set called Toronto Faces that's basically a whole bunch of faces of different people. So this, these are things that if you give them pure random input will give you outputs that look like reasonable members of the input data set. But they're generated. In the paper, they show that the nearest thing, especially in the middle, where it kind of looks like it could be cheating and just giving me answers from the original data set. It's not. It's generating new images that are statistically plausible as natural images in space and in color, which is very, very interesting. I, I, if you think this is cool, feel free to read the paper. We've made some simple examples that will generate plots, like on the far right in the scikit-learn Theodore repo. Uh, so this is learning a generative probability model, and there's no sampling. You feed in input, you do some dot products and some nonlinearities, and you get out things like this. Very cool. So that it's, this is a lot, I know. But the takeaways are neural networks are good for many, many, many vision tasks. Look at them as data-dependent feature extractors in your CV pipeline. Of course, after implementing a simple one as a benchmark, start to get more advanced with this side and explore it, because it's very interesting. Uh, Theano is a great package for CPU or GPU math in Python. And it's definitely worth exploring if you're interested. PyLearn 2 is amazing for training neural networks. If you want to learn the intricate nitty gritty of how this works, check that package out. If you just want to use them and do stuff like I showed in this presentation, Scikit-Learn Theano will give you the tools to do it. Finally, not every problem needs a neural network. The hype train is dangerous. Start with the simplest possible model and build from there. But if your problem does need a massive neural network, they're a lot of fun to play with. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned that part of the sloth looked like a carpet. Um, and now I'm wondering, wouldn't it be um, logical to, in one way, learn your system that parts of a sloth look like a carpet? So if it sees a carpet, then maybe it's, yes. or maybe it's another hairy animal. So it helps classifying. Yes. So, th so this is this is a whole new area to look at on top of it. If you're building a system and you know you're only looking at sloths, this neural network was its goal was to identify all kinds of stuff. If you just want sloths and not sloths, you can start building meta learners or learners on top of the features that come out of these neural networks. And I, I, I have a feeling that you could build something that's very, very, very good for specific tasks. It's, it's a great idea. Thanks. Further questions? Thank you very much. Doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you again and all the speakers of this afternoon.